So um, maybe so maybe you can talk first about the the Cut setting back. of the game. I mean, so you yeah, you so do have as well. Uh, it's called Roll and so, Write. It's kind of clear what the game is. <laughs> kind of. Maybe you can talk about um, what you're trying to do with so, the design. Yeah, so uh, you play as Roland, who is a, like a 1930s era uh, game designer. And Sorry, you're talking with um, me now, so. <laughs> nice. Switch of host while um, you were talking. <laughs> so he's obsessed with um, creating an award winning game. And what it really means is you're going to be filling um, this game box full of color bits to um, try to uh, fulfill different patterns and also put as much of your inspiration uh, color pair in that box and hopefully qualify for some of the award conditions as well. So there's a couple of different ways to make points. But in general, what you're doing is um, you'll be the active player will roll the dice and group them by color. And uh, you'll be placing those color bits into your box somewhere. And you don't have to place them together. And again, you're trying to, in this case, um, that pattern is fulfilled right there. And you're going to earn points at the end of the game based on um, whatever point values there and fulfilling that card. Um, yeah, so there's that. The uh, equipment cards are, are the same, except that these are less points, but they give you uh, a special action that you can perform. So back to the turn, uh, Nikki, basically, once you place um, color bits on your board, so let's say you, you chose those two green, you could put two green bits anywhere on your board. You can do that now. And since you have a, uh, that pattern there, you might want to try to put them in a way that you could fulfill that pattern. Something like that. Yep. And those cards can be fulfilled um, in one of the four kind of uh, 90 degree orientations. So keep that in okay. mind. All right. Um, so the active player um, removes those dice. So let's say you're the active player. You would actually take those green dice and place them in front of your board. Um, those are for your use this turn only. And then simultaneously, all the other players could choose from the remaining group. So several players could choose you know, to place one blue. You have to share pins, so you need to be kind of polite. Um, yeah, so you would probably go with purple or yellow there um, if you want to put something in there. Okay. Um, then simultaneously, you may perform a single action. The way you perform an action is you're going to erase uh, a color bit and perform the corresponding action. So if you look on your player board, you're going to see um, an action corresponding to one of each of the six colors. Yep, right there. So for example, um, the red action is copy and connect a bit. So you would erase any red bit on your board. Um, you don't have one. So let's say you erased a red and then you could copy any other bit. So you could, since you have green on your board, you would have erased a red to fire off that action and you can place a green next to any other, uh, next to, uh, whatever you're copying. So in this case, it would be green. So you could put a green next to either one of those greens um, if you want to perform that action. Exactly. So orange is move any other bit. So you would erase the orange and then uh, erase the bit that you want to move and color that same color bit in anywhere else. So let's say you had an orange. Um, you'd actually erase that. And then why don't you move one of those greens, erase a green and put it somewhere else. Exactly. Perfect. Um, yellow is pretty simple. It's change this color's bit. So if you had a yellow bit there anywhere on your board, um, you would erase it and then put any other color in its, in its spot. So you could change it to anything else. We should mention that the game does come with these colored dry erase markers, so you, you do have the ability to do all these colors right out of the box. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so green and blue are ways to get more of these kind of pattern cards in your hand. So you would erase a green and draw three of the green cards into your hand. 
and you would kind of look at those, compare them to what you already have, kind of find some similarities, some symmetry there, and then pick one to keep, discard the other two. Now, Chris, when you're looking at those cards, are you able to reuse the same bits for more than one card? If you yes, had that's some actually... colors lined up in an, in an overlapping pattern, oh, the, those two green work for this card and this card. Yep, exactly. Um, so just let's finish this list and I'll get into the game a little bit more. Um, blue is the same thing. So you don't even have to simulate that. You would erase a blue, draw three, keep one. Um, with purple, go ahead and draw a purple card. You would erase a purple bit, draw one purple card. And uh, that's not a very good example. You draw another one for me. Um, that's a better one. So you, <laughs> the choice you have to make immediately is, do you want to place the bit that's on that card? In this case, it's green. Or do you want to keep it for two points at the end of the game? Oh, so boy. you would make that choice. Yeah. So I don't know what you would do. You have plenty of green, probably. Um, you might want to just flip it over next to your board if you wanted to okay. keep it so for safe. two points. But you, but you make that choice. Um, some of those cards have two bits that you would place, or you could keep it for one point. Um, and the one that you drew first had just three straight points. Um, so let's kind of move on to um, completing a pattern. So while we're doing this, you may come to the point during your turn where you have a complete pattern, right? So you're okay. working on that. Um, yeah, you can fill one in if you want. Nice. Oh, I use the green. And two orange. Yeah, there you go. So, if you if you have the pattern complete, it goes from your hand to um, in, in next to your board. So basically, once it's out of your hand and in front of you, um, face up. It'll, that one will be face up. Um, actually, <laughs> sorry, it, those don't tuck. The blue ones will tuck. So just put it to oh. the right where those pins are. There you go. All right, so that's going to be worth five points at the, at the end of the game, no matter what. So now, as I explained with the erasing as part of the actions, that pattern can completely change. Those points are locked in. Those, those bits could move or erase or whatever. So you know you have five points secured for the end of the game. Um, if you look at your blue card, if you were to complete that pattern, um, it'll be worth less points at the end of the game, but you, you go ahead and tuck it at the bottom of your player board now so that the text is revealed. There you go. Um, now, instead of performing one of the standard actions by erasing a bit, you could instead choose to perform that action um, and you wouldn't have to erase anything to do it. So that's kind of an alternate action. You can get a little bit of an engine going if you kind of see um, kind of a direction you need to kind of move uh, your game or the strategy. You can kind of pick equipment based on, you know, whatever goals you're trying to achieve. Is um, this in addition to what you roll? You can then do the roll place and then use this as an additional action on your turn? So a regular turn is placing bits and performing one action. Um, if you want to perform that action, you're going to do that instead of one of the standard ones. Okay. So it's just, it's free to do and it's something that nobody else can do. So you're going to play this um, until somebody um, has three or fewer bits remaining in their box to fill in. Um, so boxes start to kind of fill up. At first, it's a little slower, but then it ramps really quickly. Um, once somebody has three or less bits remaining, there's one more turn, and then you'll score. So all the scoring happens at the end, even though... Um, Nikki fulfilled that card. She's not going to total those five points in her grand total until the end. So that's kind of nice. If you look at the player board, um, it's basically yeah, right a single column. There. Yep, yeah. you're going to just work your way down. So if you look at your inspiration card, I don't know that you dealt yourself one, but that's the yellow one, the yellow cards. So those are dealt at the beginning of the game, and that's kind of your inspiration for building this game, you know, thematically. So he was inspired to uh, build a game around a trolley system. And so whatever those two color, that color pair is, so for the strawberry, it's green and red, um, whatever color, you're going to get points for having 
um, you're going to get one point for every connected pair of those two colors on your board. Um, you'll get points for all your green cards. So you might have, I don't know, three or four. Um, same thing with the blue. You'll, if you were able to draw purple cards and keep them, then you'll total up those. Again, each one of them has um, a different amount depending on you know what it is. If you were able to completely fill your board, then you get uh, a bonus six points. And then finally, we'll compare uh, everybody's board for those three awards that are in the center there. So I'm not sure what's the orange one there. I think that's um, largest cluster of connected orange bits. So let's say Nikki yes. had three, Lincoln had seven. Um, then you kind of do, you know, first place, second place, uh, majority there. Um, so there'll be three ways to kind of score points based on those awards. You do a final total and whoever has the most points wins. One thing I didn't explain was this development chart, which is at the bottom of the player board. Um, at any time, if you've completed um, the two outer vertical columns or the bottom and the top um, rows or the diagonals, you may um, fill in the corresponding little bubble there and then you can place a bit of any color. So it's a way to kind of get a, a bit of whatever color you want onto your board. And you can kind of, um, I don't know, you can kind of get into a little bit of a run and start triggering a couple different things at once with that. So that's kind of an extra mechanic to keep things moving for you. Are there any questions? Chris, I kind of, that was kind of rushed. Well, yeah. I would like to also make sure that we highlight that there is a solo mode for this as well which is that board that Nikki has up in the uh, uh, top left corner there. Yep, so the solo board um, is basically everything that I just explained, but you'll choose um, a group to also place on the solar, solo board. Um, and if you look on the board, um, there's a calendar, which means you have 21 turns, 21 days, to kind of make as many points as you can. Um, and there are six different spots on that solo board where you're going to put a number instead of putting dots. And those numbers are little thresholds that you're trying to um, achieve by the end of the week. Um, some of them enhance the uh, actions in the kind of the main part of the game. So, for example, if you were to um, take two green uh, dice, let's say, for... For the solo board, you'd put a two um, in the green section and that little square, yeah. And so in the second part of your turn, when you're you're performing an action and you, you choose to do the green action, you would choose, instead of choosing three cards, you would choose five. So it gives you kind of some more options. And at the end of the week, there's some maintenance that happens, some of the thresholds that you need to kind of meet um, the requirements, otherwise you're penalized. So um, I actually think the solo game is is pretty interesting. Um, it's it's actually more challenging than the core game, and I would recommend being familiar with the main game before jumping into the solo. Now, uh, one of the questions from Eric was, are there any more pun-related games in our future from you guys? <laughs> no, no. Um, you know, it's, <laughs> puns, you either love them or hate them. Um, I'm a dad, so I kind of am on the love them side unfortunately but no Roland um, it was kind of came out of a way to kind of brand several Roland Wright games that we had in the works um, and so uh, the next game in the line is long shot the dice game which is based on the the board game that I designed a while back ago so you beat um, me to it that was my next question for you <laughs> yeah so it's but it stays in that kind of 30s era kind of vibe um, it's black pins it plays one to eight it's almost consistently every time 20 minutes. So it's meant to be like that, that super filler at the end of the game, like let's play a quick game of long shot. There's a ton of horses. So that's where a lot of the replayability comes from is changing out the horses for the race. So yeah, and then some other stuff coming along in the line. Um, so yeah, but no puns. Sorry if that's disturbing. <laughs> <laughs> Although we should mention that um, that if people want to buy Roll and Write, though, they, they can do that right now through uh, the Geek Game Shop. So if they're like, oh, this sounds great, I want to get this right now, absolutely, have fun. <laughs> um, absolutely, one of the and questions... I, I encourage... Oh, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. 
<laughs> I was just uh, saying, too, well, one of the questions we had earlier was, is there one set of pens per box for Roll and Write? There are. Um, we do have additional pens uh, for sale on our site. I think it's $5 for another set. Um, so, yeah, if you get a bad pen or something, we'll obviously replace it. But um, sometimes it's nice, if, especially if you have bigger game groups and you want to play this a lot with, like, four or five. It's kind of nice to have another set. Um, yeah, and I was also going to mention at the at rollandwrite.com, which it takes you to our Perplex site, there's a um, there's a video that kind of just sets the theme and gives a quick overview of kind of what we talked about. But it's animated and it's kind of cool. So rollandwrite.com, if you want to kind of check out the video, it was the Kickstarter video, but it's it's cool. I have a lot of flavor. I remember I was reading something on BGG and people had just had, they had had it in print, Roland. Right. And I was like, who yeah. is that? And they kept talking about like, who is that? <laughs> yeah. So, and I kept looking up thinking it was a designer or an artist, not realizing because I hadn't heard it yet to get the auditory pun of a roll and right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was hard to resist, of course. <laughs> so. so we have a question from, oh, sorry, Nikki, do you want to top in? Uh I just, I had a question about, I see these two cards here uh -huh. that don't yeah. give you an or. They just have um, the colors. So do you take yeah. all three of those colors instead of saving for the points like these other ones? Yep, you would instead just place those three. So some have a choice, but there's a few that either you're taking points or you're placing those three color bits. Okay. We have a question from user BGHQ Game Lab, which is why pens and not just cubes in a recessed board? Hmm. Well, it started as a roll and write game. And um, I've thought in some ways it would have been easier to do some of that. But uh, this actually turns <laughs> out it's fun. I like to, you know, take the pen and, and get in there and erase. Um, it's actually in some ways less fiddly than having a bunch of little pegs and bits and things. So um, maybe if we do roll and write the board game, we might do it. Ah. So, uh, <laughs> there you go, right straight straight from, from your mouth. <laughs> Someday. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, Chris, this is also a good chance if there was anything else that you wanted to share from Perplex that might be coming out. Um, yeah, so projects that be maybe looking for, are not on your website yet that you want to share? Yep, I'll be looking for a uh, long shot, probably coming maybe September, November. In this time, it's kind of funky, so we're not exactly sure when we're going to launch, but it's coming along. Um, you can go to longshotdicegame.com, which takes you to the Kickstarter launch page if you want to be notified for that. Um, we have another game coming along in this line of, uh, in this series. Um, we've also got more pack of games that we're kind of working on. I don't know time frame what that looks like yet, but we've always got some of those in the works. So lots of fun little things we're fiddling with over here. If, uh, if for people who maybe aren't familiar with Longshot, could you just give like the 30 second elevator pitch on sort of thematically what you were doing in that game, just so they have an idea of how the dice game might connect to it, at least via theme? Yeah, so um, it's pretty similar in some ways. Um, there are, you know, there's eight horses in this game instead of 10 from the board game. Um, it's a single race. Um, the game ends when three horses finish. And you have several things that you can do in the game to make money. So you start with like, um, I think, 10 bucks. And you can buy horses and you will make money if one of those horses wins. You can bet on horses and there's different odds depending on how they place, win, place, or show. Um, there's kind of some new mechanics uh, around the jockey where you can kind of influence how often a horse will move, depending on when the dice roll. Um, you can you can kind of make them faster, if you will. Uh, there's a couple other things that you can do. There's a concession stand that allows you to kind of manipulate the race, move horses up or back, or make money. So there's lots of little things. It feels more roll and righty than the roll and right game does. Um, <laughs> black pins single race, one to eight players. Um, it's really cool. It's it's going to be, uh, I think it's going to be a fun addition for people that kind of need that like 20 minute kind of race fix, you know, during game night. 
So Well, I'd also like to ask you about packet games because that is a series of little games that you all designed that literally fits in a little bitty case like this, um, with each one pulling out of a bag. Um, were there design limitations in having to design a game knowing it had to have such a small physical footprint? Yeah, I mean, that's the nature of it is there's just a ton of limitations, but um, it's actually in some ways easier to design in that format because a lot of those decisions are made going into it. So, you know, it's not as open ended. And, and so decisions are made faster and you know, oh, I can't do that. I can definitely do this. Um, so even though it is very limited, um, it actually can help move game concepts along much faster because of it. Uh, is there a plan to create like a second pack of games? Like, is that a, a challenge that you still feel like you want to have several, you know, give more micro game ideas floating around in your head? Yes, there, there are, <laughs> there are some new kind of fresh ideas, even within that format that we want to explore. And so we've already, we have two sets out and this would be the third set. So, um, yeah, there's, there, it's an interesting space to work in. It's, they're almost like uh, those, the one by three card is almost like a Lego because, you know, you can use it, use them as components. You can use them as cards or tiles. Um, so it's kind of an interesting space to work in for sure. Um, we've got a question from Eric actually of the licensing of those titles. Um, that it's interesting to see Chinese versions of those on the market. Like, how did that come about, uh, being able to try and translate those? Uh, yeah, so they came to us and said, hey, we want to we print these and, and get them out in China. And we kind of made some arrangements and they've done really well with them. Um, they use the same printer as us. So I knew that the quality was going to be there and the size and everything. And um, a lot of the games are language independent. So they happened to choose ones that would translate well to that market. And um, yeah, they're doing really well with it. Um, we've got a pretty big licensing deal lined up. There's not anything I can announce yet, but um, you'll start seeing them more next year uh, in other regions as well. Oh, fantastic. We always like to hear about expanded distribution for titles. That's always yeah. exciting news. I'm looking forward to seeing, yeah. hearing some details on that later. <laughs> Um, Chris, last last call. Anything else you just wanted to share while, while you've got about five minutes left on the floor? I just want to thank you guys for setting this up. It's, you know, interesting times. And I think that going forward, um, as we look at what's possible in conventions, I think this is a really necessary way to kind of show games and feature what publishers are doing. And so it's more of a thank you um, for you guys setting this up. I'm happy to be a part of it. And um, it allows us to keep making games and bring them to the market, even though uh, we have some new challenges. So um, <laughs> I appreciate the opportunity. Of course, yeah, and we're delighted to have you on. The, the Chris uh, Handy, thank you so much for um, showing us a uh, complete teaching, honestly, of Roll and Write, their newest title from Quest.